Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and once again I'm joined by Paul Lamb for the Match One Jersey podcast. Paul, welcome back, how are you doing? Not bad Paul, good to be back. It's always a pleasure to talk to you about the Celtic Match One jerseys and now this weekend, of all weekends, I'm of the firm belief that you and I would be watching Celtic win a quadruple treble and you know it's unfortunate that we're you know with the beautiful weather historically Scottish Cup final day had great blue skies uh, sunshine and we're, we're missing out on that we're obviously in lockdown so you came up with the suggestion that we would have a wee look at some Scottish Cup jerseys this week and I think uh, it's a great suggestion actually and most of the, the memories attached to these jerseys are good unfortunately the, the very first one although memories of the match may not be good it's going to be an interesting discussion about this jersey because I often find that the home jersey that followed in Centenary shirt, so this was the one that was introduced for the 1989-90 season, it's almost as if it's been lost to the depths of time. It's a bit of a classic if you ask me. You may disagree, Paul, but the 1990 Scottish Cup final jersey that we're going to start off the show talking about, looking at it just now, it's got all the hallmarks of a classic. Talk us through that home jersey. Definitely, I would say so as well. Uh, it's typical green and white hoops, evenly spaced. You know, you've got your, your seven green hoops through it. Large felt sponsor across the middle over the, the single white hoop, which I know you all approve of. <laughs> uh, the traditional Celtic crest on a, the chest with a black embroidery below it with the SFA Cup final 1990 on it. Slightly kind of muted detail back then. You know, just kind of block capitals for yeah. the match detail. Whereas a lot of the time since then, they put a bit of flair into it. A really nice shirt. It's got the unusual. It's got a, a button down collar on the end of it as well, as well as the the centre button fastener as well. Yeah, so you've got three little studs there, haven't you? You know, each side of the collar gets studded down as does the the middle bit. So the, the actual collar itself is. In effect, it's very similar to the centenary, but it's got the, the floppy collar. And uh, I remember th- this jersey coming out and looking at, as you say, there was some added detail actually to the hoops. There was a kind of zigzag, a very thin pinstripe zigzag on the, the green hoop. The umbro, the classic umbro logo with the lowercase umbro underneath. As you say, the sponsor didn't desecrate more than one hoop. And we had the full colour crest, so it was a it was a lovely strip actually. Looking back, and um, with regards to the the one you have, do you have a long sleeve version of that, or is it a short sleeve? It's a short sleeve one I've got. I, I did get one for the book. I think it must have been for the League Cup final because obviously we we were defeated by Rangers in the nineteen ninety League Cup final, and uh, we were also beaten by Aberdeen in the previous season's Scottish Cup final. It's a lovely jersey, and unfortunately sometimes if you're wearing a particular kit during an unsuccessful period, then it might be one of the ones that goes under the, the radar. But I'm looking at it just now, and I'm looking at the sponsor as well. It's the only one of the four. Uh, and interesting enough, all four jerseys we're talking about today have got different sponsors, but I spoke about... Terry Cassidy in one of the, the podcasts during the week, one of the takeover specials, Paul. And it was Terry Cassidy, you know, it was his conflict with Gerard Didi that stopped the sponsorship deal with C.R. Smith. I don't know if you if you recall that. There was a war of words publicly. Cassidy went head-to-head against Edie, who had obviously been Celtic's very first sponsor. And we lost that sponsorship deal as a result of it. And what thereafter followed was a one-year deal with People's Ford and then a sponsorless season. But yeah, down to Cassidy's uh, approach, I think, and the fact that he went public with Celtic's deal with C.R. Smith and Gerard Didi. So Gerard Didi, interesting individual who has agreed to an interview some time ago. So hopefully I'll be able to do that at some point about Celtic jerseys as well, because it was his uh, logo that was on the Celtic jerseys for probably seven years before that deal evaporated, maybe a wee while longer, and then we went back to C.R. Smith. So the sponsorship is an interesting point that needs to be discussed when you're talking about jerseys, Celtic jerseys, and it's one that I tapped into for the the book as well. And obviously we had long-standing deal with C.R. Smith in the early, early days. Now the game itself, Paul, it was our third Scottish Cup final in a row. We'd obviously beaten Dundee United and then Rangers and then we came up against Aberdeen at Hamden. And like I was saying before, I think back to these, all three of those Scottish Cup finals, it was just a beautiful day, sunshine, blue skies. We've gone into this game 
having been beaten actually in the last game of the season against Aberdeen. And it was a game that, interestingly enough, one of the boys that was on the Aberdeen bench, I ended up working with him. He scored a penalty in the penalty shootout, Graham Watson. I, I ended up working with him many, many years later. But it was a it was a strong, strong Aberdeen side we came up against that day. You know, you're looking through that. And one of the, the big things about that Aberdeen side, you know, there was a succession really of youth players that came through and it. You know, people don't really give Billy McNeil credit for starting that off. Alex Ferguson picked up on it, you know, after McNeil left Aberdeen. But Aberdeen certainly benefited from the youth policy that uh, Billy McNeil and Alex Ferguson fed into. And when you're looking through that side uh, that Aberdeen have got out that day, you've got players like, you know, Ian Jess on the bench. Jess, who was a player for me, who was just a typical Celtic-style player, Paul. You know, I would have enjoyed him in the hoops. That was a big fan of his. Oh, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. David Robertson, uh, I know he went to the dark side eventually, but he was a really, really good left back. Came through the ranks with Joe Miller, who was on the, the pitch for Celtic that day. And I think a big key part of the, the strength there was the manager, Alex Smith. Alex Smith was a, a tremendous manager in Scottish football. And, you know, he was still involved until fairly recently when he retired away to Australia. But that was a strong, strong Aberdeen side. And we just couldn't break them down that day. What was your memories of the game? Looking back, actually, I, I seem to have blanked out a lot of that game for some reason. I think the Scottish Cup finals back then were a big thing. For, I, I used to love them with the big occasion of that. And my first memories from the 85 final, you know, 10 years old, watching it on the telly, the drama coming up to the end of it. Mm-hmm. And then obviously you've got the centenary and then the following season, the 89 final. So you think coming into this game against Aberdeen, it's a big showpiece final, last game of the season. And unfortunately it doesn't work out for us. You know, memory serves me. It was a, the first Scottish Cup final to go to penalties. Mm-hmm. And just penalty shootouts are nerve-wracking at the best of times. But when so much is right on it, especially at that time, we, we hadn't won any trophies that season. It was our last hope. There was so much riding on it. And it just wasn't to be. It's a frustrating time to look back on, actually, because Celtic were really, really poor that season. I think that was the worst season, you know, under Billy McNeil in the second spell. And as you say, it might have just papered up a few cracks, actually, if we had won it that day. I always remember, you know, Rogan, Anton Rogan gets stick to this day about that. It was a great save. Most penalty saves are, because it's not as though he skied over the bar. And uh, I always remember Jack Inoski as well. Jackie, who was a a striker, an offensive player. He never took any of the penalties. It went right through to 9-8. So it was it was really unfortunate. And uh, my memories of that jersey is probably hampered by the disappointment of the team that we had. We had some great players. Paul Elliott playing at centre-half that day. Superb. Brilliant. Paul McStay. You know, even at that time, you're looking at some of the centenary players who were solid in the centenary year, like Derek White, like Anton Rogan, Joe Miller, Peter Grant until his leg break, Andy Walker. And I just don't think they were performing to the same levels when it when it came up to 1990. I mean, Walker was a, a shadow of his former self by that stage. And uh, obviously we'd brought in Tommy Coyne, who hadn't established himself yet. So tinged with a wee bit of disappointment, but a, a lovely jersey all the same. Paul, without a, a shadow of a doubt, were you able to find out who wore the jersey you've got? Unfortunately, the person I acquired it from didn't have any details mm-hmm. on it. And as typical of the time, obviously there's no numbers on the back, so you can't tie it to a particular player. It's the same, really, but it's a one-off cup final shirt. And no matter who wears it, it's one worth having. How, how did you manage to get it, Paul? Was it through the... The usual channels online, uh, someone making it known that they're selling it or going through one of the auctions? Uh, it was through another collector. I managed to acquire it. was looking to sell it. I don't know whether to fund another purchase or whatever. And just lucky it was the right place, right time. You know, because you don't really see many of these early cup final shirts. So if the opportunity comes, you've got to jump on it. Absolutely. Now, this, in terms of your own collection, Paul, you've got every Scottish Cup final jersey right back to 1990 except... For two, there are two that you are looking to add to your collection. So if there's anyone out there listening to the podcast, uh, Paul, tell us how we can get in touch with you with your your web address and tell us the jerseys that you are still searching for. The two Scottish Cup final ones I'm missing uh, are the 2017 Invincible season final and the 2018, the following season. They're the two Scottish Cup finals that I've still got to fill in in the collection. And as usual, anybody's looking to get in touch can get hold of me through the website which is 
www.myceltichshirts.co.uk. Excellent. So yes, please get in touch with Paul if you have one of these jerseys or you know someone who's looking to sell them. That's the two jerseys that are missing from your collection, Paul, but uh, we're going to be speaking about another three that are very much part of your collection. The second one is an away jersey. What's your thoughts about Celtic wearing the away shirt when they're playing in a cup final? If I remember rightly, this one in 2001 was the first time that we'd done it. Again, it was a, a game against Hibs, so there's obviously thoughts of a kit clash, but the mids from memory serves me right. Both teams wore their away strips that day, rather than one home and one away, which is very unusual. It's kind of a strange one. You you traditionally think you're going to see your team playing their home shirts, the hoops, you know, at a major cup final, because it's what you've always seen. Mm -hmm. So to see them wearing their away kit is a bit unusual. Luckily, this is a, a classic away shirt and it looks great. It's one that brings back a lot of memories as well. So It does bring back a lot of good memories because of the, the era, the success. But it was also, it was a return to a more traditional looking Celtic away jersey. We'd gone through the madness of the 90s, if I can call it that, where there was some radical you know, away shirts and people were really experimenting with colours and different designs. This went back to what I reckon is a kind of classic Celtic away template of yellow and green. Uh, the yellow itself isn't quite like the yellow of the the centenary season, Paul. The, the centenary one, it's much deeper. And then, you know, that's complemented with a dark, dark green as well. Nice V-neck collar. And, and again, when you look at that, you, you just remember the players that wore it. And in particular, the one and only Henrik Larson. It's one of the ones, isn't it, where you just recall Larson scoring goal after goal and in actual fact he scored a couple this day as well were you at the, the Celtic Hibs game? Yeah, I was there uh-huh. The only criticism again shoot me down on this because it might just be a personal thing Paul it's the crest itself I'm not a big fan of the crest getting toned down to one or two colours I think it looks better when it's a full colour crest because I think it makes jerseys look as though they're kind of training kits What's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I was, we spoke about this before in the previous podcast. I think this is maybe the, the second away strip where one of the, the feature colours was used to produce the badge. Ordinarily, I would say I would be against it as well. But I think there was something special about this kit at the time. And for me, I don't think it would look right with a traditional badge on it. The lack of white and the, the traditional emerald green on it, I think it really suits just the, the feature accent colour. It's like kind of petrol green. Uh, with the match embroidery in the same colour just above the crest on this shirt. You know, I think it's on this occasion it works for me. You're right. I mean, you would need to be adding a, another colour in there. You'd probably need to add the white into the NTL as well. Maybe just a few flashes on the collar and then you've lost the, the beauty of the kit. So you're obviously the design specialist here, Paul, because that makes perfect sense. And, and the actual sleeve patches as well even fit because... You know, when they're on the green and white hoops, they kind of look out of place, you know, they're just sleeve patches. But because of the yellow background of the tenants logo, uh, they fit in there quite nicely as well, looking at that jersey. Who wore the one that you've got? I can see there's a signature on the front of it. I believe this is match worn, and it was from the, the man of the moment that day, Mr. Henrik Larson, number seven. That must be one of your favourite jerseys, Paul. It's a, a, real, a real prize to have this. Although we wore the, the yellow jerseys and you and I discussed, Paul, whether or not that was the right thing to do, particularly when, you know, the, it was always a battle of the greens when you played Hibs. I remember Jock Steen saying that, the battle of the greens, but uh, every time we play them now, one of the teams wears an away jersey, but in a cup final, generally both, just to avoid any argument. But when Celtic were preparing to go up for the actual trophy, they swapped into the hoops jerseys as well. It's something I spoke to Tom Boyd about, Paul. It's good that they obviously prepared home and away shirts for the final in preparation for a decision being made against Hibs, whether one would wear home and away or whatever, you know, so and it was good to see the players change into the, the hoop shirts for the actual presentation, rather than wearing the, the away strip. Because in the history books, it's the green and white hoops. With regards to the decision to make it, both clubs wear away jerseys, Paul, I'm, I'm guessing that's right down to probably the, the television companies, rather than the referee making a decision that there's a colour clash. It's probably down to the, the TV uh, coverage, isn't it, really? Just so that people can differentiate between the two. In a big game like the Scottish Cup final, which I'm guessing would be beamed throughout the world, so, moving on to the next cup final, the next Scottish Cup final jersey we're going to talk about, Paul. This is a Scottish Cup final jersey from 2005. First of all, talk us through the design of the, the hoops back then. 
The design, uh, I'd say it's a, a straight up throwback to the, the 1978 shirt with uh, traditional plain hoops on it, a white fold down collar with the white V neck triangle in front of it. I mean, mm-hmm. instantly it just makes me think of that 78 shirt when uh, <laughs> the first time the, the badge appeared on the, the hoops. It was another one, it was, I think this was the, the last Umbro shirt that we had. And it was at a time where it was the, the last couple we, we had a new Umbro shirt each season for the last two years of their deal. Mm-hmm. So this is one it only featured for one season. The classic, it's just the, the plain black embroidered Umbro double diamond logo with no text underneath it. Uh, again, it's a throwback to the, the 70s when the Umbro logo first appeared on the hoops as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many good features in it. There are. It's a good point you make about the, the double diamond. I was just thinking there what I preferred because you had the original Umbro, which was just a double diamond, and then there was like a, a few tracksuit tops, Paul, from the 70s. And a mutual friend of ours has got a 1973 George Conley one, just bottle green, white collar. And then there's the, the double diamond, but it's a wee kind of patch, a sewn on patch, and it's, I think, red, red and black with a bit of white, but it's just really, really smart. And it's something Umbro don't do anymore. They then started using a lowercase Umbro underneath. In the 90s, that changed to quite bold capital letters Umbro, which I wasn't a fan of. But then they went to this kind of more streamlined version and it looks really, really good looking back. And above there, obviously, you've got the match embroidery as well. I mean, one one point on the collar that I would make is, you know, on the underside of the collar, it was black. So depending on how the wind blew or how the the player wore the jersey. There was a, an element in black there as well, which was quite prominent in some pictures. But it's something that Craig Bellamy certainly didn't like, is it? <laughs> That's right. Uh-huh. He used to cut the bloody collar off his shirt. And again, Jim Greening, who we spoke about last week, he's got one of Craig Bellamy's jerseys with the, the collar cut off. So that obviously annoyed him. But it looked all right with the, <laughs> without a collar as well, to be fair. Who wore the jersey that you've got in your collection? Uh, well, this one is it's a match prepared shirt. It wasn't actually worn. It was prepared for Ross Wallace. It's got the number 33 on the back with Wallace across the shoulders. And it, another unusual feature, I think this was one of the first games where the, the Scottish Cup final sleeve patches appears on both sleeves. Rather, the, like, so the previous one in 2001, the, the sleeve patch is only on the right hand or the right arm. Uh, whereas this one, it appears on both of them. And the, the run-up to the games, nobody knows who's going to be actually playing in the squad or featuring in the game, so shirts are made up for everyone. Obviously, Ross never made the, the squad that day, so this is a shirt that was made up for him but never used. Ross Wallace, I mean, there's a wee blast from the past. Uh, we've, we've mentioned quite a few players who have come through the ranks at Celtic Park. We're famous for bringing youth through. And Wallace has had a, a lengthy, lengthy career. You know, he's only 34, Ross Wallace, he's only 34. He's done really well since leaving Celtic. He's played with a number of English clubs. His entire career after Celtic Park until now has been in the English leagues, Sunderland, Preston, Burnley, Sheffield Wednesday, Fleetwood. And just this year he signed for St Mirren. So that that's an interesting one. But the, the game itself is memorable for quite a few reasons. Firstly, it was Martin O'Neill's last game as a manager so it felt like the end of an era and it was a, a 1-0 win Alan Thompson scored the winner it was the final game that Craig Bellamy played in for Celtic and I always think back to the, the story that was in Gordon Strachan's book about Bellamy because there, there was an option to buy him you know he was at Newcastle at that time and Celtic had an option to buy him for 5 million quid but it would have been uh, Strachan's transfer budget would have had to go on that one player and uh, he went and got Boruch, Zaraski and Nakamura um, for the for the equivalent transfer fee and, and wages. So, But I just think, you know, Bellamy was a very exciting player. When I look at this jersey, I think of Craig Bellamy. I think of the hat trick. I think of the goal he scored against Rangers. And I just think of Bellamy and the fact he used to cut the collar off, you know. Moving on to the final jersey, Paul, which is a, it's an interesting one, I think. Another Scottish Cup final jersey that you've managed to add to your collection. Fairly recently, we're going back... Just last year, 2019, the historic treble treble winning jersey, really. Uh, going back to Hamden, I remember the game well, sitting next to the, the proper old heads when Eduard just broke away after Mikel Lustig probably played his last ever ball for Celtic through and uh, Eddie knocked it away. It was just, what a sense of elation, wasn't it? Oh, it was an unbelievable Again, It was another one of those games that went a goal down early. Fighting back, it was, again, it was harking back to the, the 80s Cup finals. 
you know, there's a lot of tension in it, there was a lot riding on it, but the relief of the, the elation when those goals went in, you know, it's goosebumps stuff, I think they say. Uh, there was various things conspiring against Celtic and Neil Lennon came in and done what he had to do and we came through it and we got the treble in the bag and you know, looking back on that particular day, it was nervy in the stands that day. Obviously, we came through and we won it, and Eduard showed what he's capable of, and he's, he's actually kicked on from that this season. Lennon was playing a team that, you know, he refused really to play some of the, the lone guys, didn't he? So he was playing Lustig at right back instead of Toljan. He was playing Simunovic and Ayer uh, instead of playing Benkovic. And he, he was basically planning for the, the season ahead because he knew these guys weren't going to be playing. But when I when I think of this jersey, though, I do think of players like Benkovic. You know, it it was an interesting design because the collar almost harked back to you know the days of Jimmy Quinn. Yeah, in fashion sense, I think they call that like a, a granddad collar, where it's just a plain round end on it, and it's got a, for some reason it's got like a, a small opening at the top. It's only about an inch or two wide with a button on it. It, it doesn't seem to serve any purpose other than being a piece of detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a, a nice, it's a nice finish on it, you know. New Balance jerseys have taken a bit of stick, Paul. I'd say this is one of their better designs, to be honest with you. Although the actual quality, of a lot of the jerseys that you see replica style are pretty poor. What's the match worn ones like? Are they much the same? There's not a great deal of difference with the, the New Balance shirts between the players and the replicas. They refer to the, the player ones as elite versions. Mm-hmm. They're usually, a, it's more a, a tailored fit and depending on which season you'll have some maybe extra details or like uh, a ventilated fabric on the, the back of the shirt, this kind of stuff, you know, just for comfort for the players, things like that. Other than that, I mean, it's not a great deal to the, the naked eye where you would be able to instantly spot, you know. Mm-hmm. It used to be really obvious, didn't it? You know, a match worn in a, in a replica, but the margins are getting thinner and thinner. The proper player spec or elite shirts. The big problem from a collecting point of view is they sell the elite shirts from the official club shop, you know, uh, and you can buy them. And the, de- the, the traditional match details that go on the shirts, the, the name sets and the numbers and sleeve patches are no different from what the players were to what you would buy. So you've got to be very wary when it comes to buying these kind of things. You can't always take someone at their, their word. No, and again... You get to know the people you can trust in, in those circles as well, Paul, uh, within the, the Celtic and match-worn jersey collecting circles. It was a, a game that was historic in so many different ways. We had obviously lost Stevie Chalmers and Billy McNeil, and there was very impressive TIFOs as a result of that. You look at the celebration photographs of Celtic players, and you can see the, the big numbers on the shorts as well. They, they would be nice to be able to get the, the shorts, because you had the number nine on the back and the number five on the front, didn't you? So they, they would be nice additions to the match-worn collection. But in relation to the actual top as well, I'm looking at that thinking, you know, the only thing that if I've got a criticism, it would probably be the sponsor. Um, I thought the Daffabet gold sponsor, you know, for the Lisbon 50th anniversary jersey, worked really, really well. It looked really classy. But then it looks like a heat transfer on, and it doesn't, you know, with the, the black and, and the yellow, they've obviously just plastered it on. And the jerseys become sandwich boards, don't they? They just become big advertising boards. And it's unfortunate. One thing Celtic have never done so far, certainly, is sold the advertising rights to the stadium. Uh, obviously, we've got a couple of sponsors on the jerseys now, but thankfully, Celtic Park has not been sold out as of yet in that respect. So, yes, it's, I think, an excellent jersey for New Balance. Um, we're at a stage then where you're only wearing it for one particular season. Was this one that you have in your collection? Was it match worn? And if so, by whom? Yeah, this one was match worn. Very fortunate to get a hold of this one. And it was worn by James Forrest in the, the final. I've seen a couple of James Forrest match worn jerseys and they're tiny. They're absolutely tiny, Paul. Is it the same as the one you've got? Yeah, it's one of those ones when it comes to photographing it from a website, I'm feared to put it on the mannequin <laughs> because of the size of it. It's, it overstretches. You know, there's the, the tailored fit that the players wear nowadays are very tight. When it comes to the elite shirts compared to the replicas, although they, they both say medium or large, respectively. It's a different cut. You know, uh, a large player's elite shirt would probably be akin to a, a medium replica. The way they're cut to, to fit more comfortably. The only downside to this shirt, I would say, is the, the match detail across the, the chest, the, the William Hill Scottish Cup final. Again, it's like a heat-printed transfer that's applied to the shirt rather than the traditional embroidery. 
I think the embroidery always adds a wee bit more class to ah, the shirt. Indeed, indeed. But I think it's possibly to do with the elite shirt fit, whereas the, if it had embroidery on it, it would be tight against the skin, so it would irritate on the inside of the shirt. So mm-hmm. I think that's probably why they go with it. the heat transfer. Again, that's just an opinion, and I don't know if that's true or not. Well, you're probably right. They're looking at all these things. I remember back in the day, some of the badges were a nightmare, uh, rubbing against your nipples, Paul. So, you know, I could, I could imagine that uh, that type of thing obviously needs to be avoided, particularly at the top level, at the elite level. Paul, you've provided us with a memory that still seems pretty fresh in my mind, you know, sealing the treble treble. And just unthinkably, we, we managed to go on a run this season that led us to the point where we could well have been enjoying a quadruple treble at the time that we've been recording this podcast. It's a real shame, Paul, but, you know, what should happen is that Celtic will be awarded title retrospectively and with regards to the Scottish Cup, who knows, could it be played next season? Probably without much much issue. But, Paul, thank you again for sharing the remarkable items from your collection and I look forward to once again looking through your match-worn jerseys next week. No more, Paul. It's a pleasure to be on it. 